Thank you, Linda. Thank you all for coming. So uh, here you see two images of distinctive musical traditions from southwestern China. On the left, uh, people seeing it an important New Year ritual to or for the, the female deity Sa. On the right, people from the same community singing choral big songs in a stage performance. Perhaps the form of these activities appears quite different from that of musical traditions in other places or different from musical traditions that you've been engaged with. Yet many of the questions that arise in attempting to understand the situation and the meaning of these singing traditions today are questions that are also extremely important in other contemporary musical contexts. One of the most central questions is how to understand the way that change is identified and is occurring. We know that for traditions to be passed on for generation to generation, um, that they are necessarily in a state of gradual change. But how should we understand or even act in relation to what appear to be vast, rapid and unprecedented changes that these and many other musical traditions are experiencing in the contemporary period? Do these seemingly unprecedented changes really represent an unprecedented shift within the musical traditions and how can we tell? Of the many different analytical approaches or theoretical cuts, as ethnomusicologist Anthony Seeger eloquently describes them, that we might use, thinking in terms of musical resilience offers a useful conceptual tool. It promotes understanding of the current situation in a way that sidesteps potential false binaries such as either tradition or change. And it avoids deficit approaches which might focus on thinking about what's lacking from current music making rather than seeing and hearing the full picture of what is there. I'd like to share with you some of the interesting insights that have emerged through thinking about the music making I've been researching in southwestern China in relation to the concept of musical resilience. So southwestern China is a region with great cultural diversity. One way that this diversity can be understood is according to the official categorization, which dates largely from the 1950s. Uh, this categorization, as you may know, identifies one majority group known as Han, um, a population of around 1.2 billion or approximately 91% of the total population, and 55 Xiaoshuminzu or minority groups that number in total roughly 100 million and about 9% of the population. And those minorities um, live largely in the western and the northeastern border areas. So on this map here, you can see the eastern area where there's no colour is largely the um, place where Han people are living. And the other coloured areas show you where the major language groups, the different colours used for each uh, different language group of those minorities. And within those um, colours, it's a little difficult for you to see, there's actually different hatchings according to the different uh, languages within those language families that are spoken by different groups in those areas. Um, what you can see if you look down into the southwest there is an extremely dense patchwork of different colours, different hatchings representing um, different languages and different cultural or ethnic groups, all speaking different, different languages. Um, the southwest is also an area where minority people form a relatively substantial proportion of the population. For example, um, in Guizhou, the province where I've conducted most of my research, which is down in that southwest area, almost 40% of the population identify as minority. So the southwestern group that I'll focus on today is the Gum, usually spelt in English K-A-M, somewhat confusingly. I've been conducting musical ethnographic research in Gum areas since 2004. And I've been fortunate to be invited to join my gum friends and teachers in many gum musical performances. So gum people are known in Chinese as Dongzhu. As I mentioned, they're one of the 55 officially recognised minority groups with a population of 2.88 million in the 2010 census. Uh, many gum people still speak a dialect of gum as their first language. That's a tonal, monosyllabic, Taikadai family language with no widely used written form. It's completely different from Chinese. Um, I'm not sure if we have any 
Chinese language speakers here, but uh, in gum we might say xiao wo dou mi mei ga, whereas in Chinese um, we might say ni men hui chang ji shou ge. So you can hear it's really completely different. So most gum people are resident in the grey area that's marked just very lightly on this map, the intersection of um, Guizhou, Hunan and Guangxi. Um, most, uh, roughly 50% of the gum people live in Guizhou, which uh, is the, you can see it marked there on the left, top left side. About 30% in Hunan, 10% in Guangxi. But significantly, around 10% of gum people are now formally registered as living in various other areas outside their traditional homeland, if you might call it that. This um, population resident elsewhere includes many gum young people who are living in other places for employment, sometimes tertiary study. And that's a big social change that I'll come back to later. So this gives you some um, idea of gum villages, usually in very mountainous areas. Um, the region where I work is in the valley at the bottom of that really big mountain that you see in the top left picture. Uh, gum villages are usually along waterways and the culture has a great emphasis of water. Um, you can see some of the architecture in that uh, photo in the middle there. You can also see all the chilies drying there in the sun. Chilies are as a really important ingredient in gum food. And on the right you can see some of the architecture close up and especially you can see the tall tower or de lo. Sometimes in English we call it, um, it's known as a drum tower. That's a really important public communal space in southern gum areas. It's where a lot of singing and other um, significant rituals take place. So everyday village life still revolves around rice planting and harvesting, firewood collection and these kinds of daily tasks are still part of what people do, as are um, things such as weaving. You can see the women setting up a loom um, to weave the gum cloth that you'll see in lots of videos that I'm going to show you today. Now recent and the huge gum youth migration to urban centres that I've just mentioned, as well as growing school attendance rates and a marked rise in television viewing, have led to a decline in gum seeing amongst younger generations. However, it's clear that a vibrant musical heritage nevertheless continues to be maintained in my, within my main field site of Sham and nearby gum communities. As you see here, contemporary forms of distinctive gum cultural and spiritual or religious traditions continue to be practiced in Sham and some other rural areas. Although these musical genres and some others do continue, most are performed left less extensively than has been reported in the past, and a few have even become virtually obsolete or solely sung in stage performances. So here you see um, again some images to um, the singing, singing to Sa that takes place important, in an important New Year ritual. You can see an image of um, married women from the bride and the groom's family singing Ga Gao Dan, or songs to get quilts, which is um, the process of passing the bride's dowry to the, um, the groom's family. And Shi Gum, or Gum Opera, it's, an, it's a widely um, popular form of entertainment in the New Year period. Uh, so just to show you some of this, I'd like to play a little bit of the Ga Gao Dan, the singing at a wedding. <coughs> Bye bye. 
So today, the most well-known of the many gum musical genres is big song. It's the genre I focused on most extensively in my research and I'll mainly discuss today. So the English name big song is a translation of the Chinese da gu. Da gu in itself is one of several possible translations of the gum ga lao. And ga lao is one of uh, many different gum names for a specific kind of gum choral singing. Since there was no generic name for these songs until researchers began working in gum communities in the 1950s, we can say that this genre has essentially been created through those state-sponsored research activities. However, of course, the songs have long been recognised by gum people as an important form of cultural heritage. Today, there are many differences between state-promoted and village forms of big song, as you can see in the two images here, and as I'm going to discuss in detail today. What's particularly interesting and important about the situation regarding Big Song is that responses to this situation have been crucial for sustaining the tradition. Even though the responses to the imposition of staged singing and the research and so on do not seem to have been the intended aim of those developments such as stage performances. So first, Big Song in what I call the village tradition usually takes place in the Delo, the uh, pagoda-shaped building that's the important public communal space in southern gum areas and it happens at New Year in the public, at least in the public performances. A fire is lit in the middle of the Delo and a group of women and a group of men will sit on opposite sides and take turns to sing usually three songs and there's also between each set of songs there's a ritualised exchange of deal which are chanted phrases that uh, are often very funny and the groups ex exchange this. So they learn the songs during the year. And in fact, the songs, although they've now become a symbol of all gum people, um, originate from an area where only um, about 4% of gum people live today. As I mentioned, uh, in the 1950s, researchers went to gum areas and the research that they did was probably one of the main factors that led to the development of staged big song singing. Um, this is the first book that was written about Big Song, um, published in 1958, and still one of the key texts, I think, um, in, this, in this field. So Big Song, in what I call a stage tradition, as it has a history now of 60 years and a clear um, pattern of development. Um, on the top left, you see a picture of some of my teachers in, the 19, in 1964 in a stage performance that, that they took part in. On the um, right hand side, you see a picture in 2005, um, a performance of 10,000 people singing Gum Big Song um, that I also took, was invited to take part in at the local county centre. And down on the bottom left in 2011, a performance of 200 gum people singing Big Song in the village where I, um, where I usually conduct research. Um, it's the biggest stage performance I've ever seen there. In 2006, the Chinese government identified Big Song as a form of national level intangible cultural heritage. And then in 2009, it was inscribed on UNESCO's representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity under the title Grand Song. So before we have a look at a video of gum singers performing Big Song in these two contexts, I'd just like to um, uh, highlight to you some of the differences you might notice in these, two, in these two different videos. Firstly, a big difference in the number and arrangement of singers. There's often a difference in the time of year of performance. As I mentioned, the village singing is usually at New Year, whereas stage performances can take place at any time. The interaction between the singing groups in the village context is completely different to the type of interaction that usually occurs in the stage performances. There are often many other differences in terms of aesthetic criteria especially in lyrics, in the speed, the pitch, and often um, in the timing. Uh, as you'll notice in the stage performances, obviously all the singers singing in a somewhat coordinated way is considered important, whereas that's not really key in the village performances that take place. Some of the differences are also due to two ideas that are often applied to the stage performances. 
First, the musical aspects of the stage performances have often undergone Ishu Jiagong, which I translate as artistic processing, at the hands of composers and other cultural bureau employees, who are themselves sometimes gum people. The resulting music is invariably higher pitched than the big song singing in gum villages. Sometimes it even involves more than the standard two simultaneous vocal lines. Rather than following the villagers fairly slow measured singing, the performers in stage contexts either sing at a faster speed or use dramatic alterations of tempi throughout a song. They're not, face, they're not seated facing each other in a circle, but usually stand in rows facing an audience and often accompany their singing with gestures. Second, although some of the big songs performed on stage are billed as Yuan Tai, which we might translate as authentic, they're almost never performed on stage as they're sung in the village context. This is either because they've undergone that artistic processing or because they may be a single song that's created from sections of different big songs from different regions and consequently lacks any lyrical integrity. And I'll come back to this concept shortly. So let's have a look at two um, videos. These are both taken from the village where I do my research in the same um, new festival of 2011. So you'll see um, some of the same singers in the village context and then on stage.
So uh, today, two distinct big song traditions are now clearly recognised by gum people. They distinguish them in, in various different ways. In fact, singers never perform in the stage manner within the village context. If they did perform um, artistically processed songs within that village context, in the Delo New Year, it would certainly be a loss of face. It would be showing that they didn't have that um, real village repertoire available to them. Um, however, the stage form is nevertheless influencing village singing in certain ways. For example, um, because the same group of singers are asked to sing songs from their village repertoire in artistically processed versions in stage performances, um, sometimes they're forgetting which version is the one that's from our village, which is the version that we've been asked to sing on stage. And sometimes there's a few different versions that they're asked to sing in stage contexts. We can also see that occasionally some of the aesthetic de decisions that singers are making within the village context seem to reveal the influence of aesthetics used in the stage performances. But perhaps the most important fe feature of big song singing today concerns the people who are singing. Originally, big song was only performed by unmarried youth and recently married men. You might have noticed that in the um, video that I played you of the village singing, in that deal where they exchanged, um, there was a kind of joke about, we don't know if you're girls or married women, and the women replied, oh, we're married women, and laughed. Actually, this is what they're referencing. We shouldn't be here singing. It was, in, in the past, that was, that was prohibited in this and many other um, gum areas. But what's happened is that with women's involvement in the stage performances, it's given them confidence to relax that local prohibition and go back and sing the songs. Since the youth are largely absent from gum villages, they're not there able to learn songs during the year. They might just return for a week or two at New Year, or maybe not at all. Um, these women have now taken on the key role in maintaining and transmitting the big song singing and other gum song genres, even though not so long ago they, they would have been prohibited from doing so. And I think this is one of the most interesting aspects of the current situation where the concept of resilience helps to understand what's going on. Although resilience is not presently a common analytical concept in music research, it's featured widely within um, fields such as biology, environmental studies, indigenous studies, psychology and psychiatry, social work, education and youth studies, with its definition being tailored slightly in each different context. Um, for instance, in describing the resilience thinking of 1980s approaches to climate change research, Valerie Nelson and Tanya Stathers state that resilience is the ability of a system to absorb disturbance, for example, market changes, fire, conflict, and maintain function, structures, and feedback processes. In a study focusing on indigenous perspectives in relation to notions of resilience in psychology and psychiatry, um, Kermayer and colleagues explain that the ability to do well despite adversity has been termed resilience and attributed to specific traits or characteristics of the individual. In general reference sources, such as the 2014 Oxford English Dictionary, we see resilience defined as the quality or fact of being able to recover quickly or easily from or, being, or resist being affected by a misfortune, shock, illness, etc. And the concept of resilience is compared with robustness and adaptability. So in the case of Big Song, what are those challenges? In fact, there's a number of factors that have presented challenges to Big Song singing in recent times. As I mentioned, there's almost a complete absence of youth in rural gum communities. They're the cohort who were originally the group learning Big Songs during the year and performing in the Delo at New Year. There's also been a great range of lifestyle changes um, such as the initiation of and the increase in television viewing as a really popular form of entertainment. There's been a spread of nine years compulsory education where people are more exposed to the Han or the Mandarin language and perhaps living away from the village for part of the year for their schooling. And there's also been increased involvement of gum villages in large numbers of staged big song performances. There have also been direct interventions within the village system of big song transmission and performance. These include the promotion of big song singing competitions within gum villages, 
such as to celebrate International Women's Day, and they require villagers to sing in a particular format when presenting supposedly authentic staged song performances, especially when they're outside gum regions. Another example of the kinds of interventions is the 2008 establishment of a nationwide system of um, representative transmitters in Chinese, that includes the designation of only certain gum people as responsible for teaching big song. And that doesn't accord with um, the traditional way in which that transmission system would be structured and identified. The expanded context for big song singing also indirectly influences village singing and presents a particular kind of challenge. As I mentioned, many villages have been involved in staged big song performances where they're required to sing the same songs in quite a different way from in the village. Recordings of these stage performances are also widely viewed on BCD and DVD within gum villages. Finally, the increasing financial benefits that can be gained from big song singing, especially in competitions in other areas, also presents a challenge that impacts on village singers in many different ways. As an ethnographer, when I think about the concept of musical resilience in big song singing, my greatest interest is in knowing gum views of how these challenges or changes are viewed in relation to big song. Perhaps not surprisingly, gum attitudes to this kind of inquiry are multiple and they're shifting. But the actions of gum people and the way they describe their actions are really instructive. While the precise features of big, a village big song scene that middle-aged and older gum villagers remember from their youth have obviously altered, as they also have for many other gum song genres. During the 10 years that I've conducted research in gum areas, more gum villagers have been involved in singing big song than in the singing of any other gum song genres. But of course, there seem to be many differences between that singing and big song singing of earlier times. Um, when I first discussed these new developments with gum villagers, they often described the situation as bing gum, changed a lot. Consequently, I initially viewed these developments such as the public big song performances by married women as unprecedented changes to or transformations of a long-standing tradition of big song singing. However, as I continued field research and continued thinking about big song singing, I came to believe that viewing the development simply as changes to a musical tradition did not entirely accord with gum views of the situation. For example, gum villagers still describe the exchange of big songs in the Delo as song lao ga, or taking turns to sing songs, as you saw in that video and as you see in the image on the left here. Despite the many changes to the cohorts of singers involved, and the singing still occurred as part of the important celebrations at Lunar New Year, just as it had in the past. Moreover, when these middle-aged women engaged in public big song singing in the village context, they still developed social bonds and responsibilities amongst group members, which indicated that this singing continued to be enmeshed in a traditional framework of social activity. They also would have to invite certain people to join their group on the basis of friendship and relationships rather than on the basis of whether that person had um, musical ability that they really needed or not. And when 200 women from Shum um, took part in that Guinness uh, Book of Records uh, performance that I mentioned, the 10,000 people singing Big Song, um, as the largest gum um, group from any region, they acquired substantial cultural and symbolic capital just as they would have accrued from other big song performances in the village context. Moreover, the women singing in that staged context lent honour to the Sham region as a whole, rather than just to the individual singers, again, as it would within the traditional um, big song singing system. As you see on the right, in the unusual instance when a group of women that I regularly sang with were asked by a group of men to go to teach the men to sing, um, the men were still said to be, uh, get to be ao ga, or getting songs, as it's referred to in gum, the expression for learning songs. Even though, as you can see here, the songs were taught by their female peers, not by an older gum song expert. And as you might, might be able to pick out, the men are actually learning mostly by recording the songs on their mobile phones, so they can go away and sing them later. <coughs> 
Nevertheless, how about gum views concerning lakka or song lyrics within the contemporary context? Lakka literally translates as the bones of songs. It uses the metaphor of the skeleton to indicate the primary importance of lyrics within gum scene. Um, songs are traditionally learnt by chanting the song lyrics, not by singing the song. And the lyrics are considered key to determining the song's quality. There are also complex rhyming patterns within the lyrics that are actually considered integral to the concept of song. The central importance of lakka to gum singing means that we have to consider the lyrics when we're thinking about musical resilience and big song. I'd like to share with you now a short video featuring my main singing teachers, Sa Liang Kai, Sa Yun Yong, Sa Yu Jin, just demonstrating the process of chanting as happens in song, big song transmission and singing big song lyrics, and then discussing the three most important aspects of lyrics to gum singing as a whole. จีจมเมียงเตตาปานลาไปเมียงหน้าแนเอาซ่าโกงจมดันตาไกวลาจันมาผู้แปลงแปลงบ้างไปไปก้าวจางซ่องแหววุ่นกงย่องจะจงเป
แค่ไปที่จะสอบจะไปแค่ไปเหมือนจะแค่ไปเหมือนจะลากจะแค่ไปเหมือนจะลากเหมือนจะขวาจะไปมุ่งกาจุ่มยี่ตัวอันกลางสุจีอย่างย่างกลางหนึ่งอ่ะกาเสียมที่ลากเลยยี่อ่ะยี่ยี่หันนะหันสันเงาจงตาปีกว่ากลางมังหน้าเดี๋ยวสุวิจุสือเศร้าชินีเลยเดี๋ยวก็จะผีเล่นมังจ่าสุวิจังยังกาแค่เลยลากจะปีจะเล่นว่าไงแค่สุกไปปีจะไปสันเงาแค่จุสือกลางเป๊ะยี่สุจุสือเนี่ยเออน้ำกลางพ่องเลยยี่สิบเนี่ยปีรุ่นอะไรปีรุ่นยี่สิบปีรุ่นคือยาวเสียหาวเสียงยาวยาวชกเนี่ยแค่สุน้ำกลางพ่องยาวชกเนี่ยแค่สุว่าประมาณจีจอนวันเนี่ยจะซื้อเอ่อเยาว์ไว้ไว้เยาว์ยากางเปล่าจ้าจะเปล่าเปล่าเปล่าเออซื้อดิกุยโจเจียนสุดท้ายต่างใจเออก็จะเออเหมือนกุหลาบต่างใจเยาว์เปล่าเปล่าเนี่ยต้องชูตาก็ดีจะก็หันยี่เอ่อลากกายนี่ยงเฉยเป็นสันเงาผู้ชายผู้ชายเชียงใหม่งอสีฮอนนี่อ่ะจะมาถอยยาวชกเนี่ยวัวไอ้นี่อ่ะกาเกิมเจ๊ตี้ก็ไอ้อุบๆนี่ดิมอสีตาเล้มไอ้หน้าว่าก่อนจ้องกลางกำปักเลยจะเสียเนี่ยดิเนี่ยไอ้หน้าไอ้หน้าก่อนจ้องไอ้หน้าเวนเลยจ้ะปีวีอ่ะมอสีปีวีดังกันมอก็สุดเจ๊บอกงอไอ้นี่อ่ะมอสีปีวีดังกันเออจะมาจะมาแล้วตอนเส้นมันจะมาจะมาอย่างไอ้ไหนว่ากันปีวียาวชกเนี่ยมอสีน้องปอเขาอยากชกเนี่ย Okay, so we've seen some of the three crucial aspects to Lakka. But increasingly in staged big song performances, singer asked, singers are asked to perform, perform songs that are not particularly educational, since these are often more attractive to non-gung speakers. When they give performances billed as authentic, for example, they're usually required to sing a medley of different sections from different big songs. The resultant song lacks all the three key features of gum song lyrics, educational content, uh, rhyming patterns, and metaphor. Uh, here's an example of this from a performance that I also took part in in 2012. We were awarded first prize in the Yuan Shen Tai division of a song competition in the county center, celebrating the 91st birthday of the Chinese Communist Party. As you'll notice, sections of four different songs are combined in this apparently um, authentic performance. And uh, the kind of oral effect is pretty much what the oral effect was like in the hall.
can hear the pitch is getting higher and higher. <laughs> so we've seen that gum communities, like many others in southwestern China, have faced a great range of challenges that also impact on the continuation of their musical systems. These challenges are all the more problematic and concerning in minority communities, where traditional seeing has been one of the few ways in which knowledge is recorded and passed down. Not only is the tr transmission of this knowledge at stake with the music, but so too is the very language in which it is expressed, since few minority languages now receive any state support within the Chinese education system. The effects of these challenges within the music musical context are certainly changes of a type, but with the help of musical resilience as a conceptual tool, we have at our disposal another way of looking at the developments, which is perhaps somewhat more nuanced and which gives more attention and weight to the important role of various gum cultural custodians themselves in enjoying and promoting gum big song. While what I've seen to date regarding gum big song seems to suggest that it is musically resilient, especially when compared to a number of other gum song genres, we cannot be certain that it will continue to remain that way. For example, while staged big song performances have indirectly enabled gum people to relax prohibitions and maintain big song singing within gum villages, um, those staged performances that the villagers are taking part in are increasingly more familiar to younger generations of singers than are the, the few village big song performances at New Year. Gum areas also seem poised for a massive expansion of gum cultural tourism. Late last year, a high-speed rail line was opened that runs from gum areas to the huge southern city of Guangzhou in less than four hours, and only recently the trip would have taken several times more than that. Last month, a huge gum cultural show, um, which seats an audience of 3,000 at a time, opened near the county centre of the main gum county of Liping. Even in the small but well-known big song singing region of Xiam, where I've done most of my research, a government grant for this year of 5 million yuan, that's about a million Australian dollars, to cover the concrete buildings with wooden cladding in traditional style suggests that new developments are afoot. These kinds of developments are again representative of events taking place in many other southwestern Chinese communities, and some kind of impact upon music making must be expected. But in the gum case at least, evidence shows that communities have been pragmatic and resourceful in musical responses to the situation to date. Social networking and the acquisition of various types of capital through singing has always been important in gum big song singing performances. It might be that these new tourists and other developments are used to transpose that original gum emphasis into the contemporary era. While clearly it will depend on the actions that are taken by gum people themselves within gum communities, the contemporary expression of social function and meaning appears to be a key attribute of these and other resilient music traditions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Catherine. I'm, I'm sure uh, most of us here can think of lots of other domains that we could apply that idea of musical resilience in. Um, can I ask you now to, um, for some questions, uh, and following the questions, we'll, uh, um, there's a free uh, reception that will be provided just outside so we can continue the conversation informally after the lecture. Chris. Oh, thanks, um, that's really interesting. I, I can see um, the usefulness of, of using resilience as sort of a frame to look at. I was just thinking about the ramifications of that and was wondering, um, are there features that uh, you think on a musical level contribute to musical resilience, or is it the people that are, res are resiliently stewarding music? I suppose in the case of Big Song, at least, it's a bit of a combination of both. I mean, the fact that it's a choral song genre um, that can be performed by groups and have um, you know, a kind of community meaning and be useful in the large-scale stage performances that are very popular within the Chinese context does kind of lend it to that 
lend its usefulness in that context. Um, but, you know, and the fact that it can involve many people is part of the tradition. As you can see from the structure of the music, it's structured in this really clever way where there's a, a lead singer who will chiga and who remembers the lines really well and then everyone else joins in at a certain point and there's a singer who's one or two singers who sing the upper musical line who act like conductors um, so they keep it when everyone listens to those singers they can kind of keep in in time and that's why somehow those hundreds of people when they sing together as long as they can hear that um, that upper vocal line they can kind of sing together so i suppose those features do um, help it in that sense but i really think um, that it's the actions of people that's been so critical i mean the the maintenance of big song singing through spe especially married women's actions it's i think we have to remember this has got no support whatsoever from outside the community it's a it's a prohibition in a culture that's um, until recently been known as not, not um, perhaps we would say relatively conservative, especially in terms of women's roles. So that's changing and again it's changing thanks to the singing in, in large part. So it's really complex interplay. It's a great question, yeah. Mm. Um, in the early 90s, I was at a um, conference in, in Greece where some Bulgarian women dancers and singers, elderly, well, I suppose they're about my age actually, um, visited, it was just after the, um, the fall of, of, of the Soviet Union breakup and all that sort of thing. And um, they were talking about the fact that um, throughout their whole life they hadn't been able to perform their songs and dances in the ways that they had actually learned them in their twenties. And then when it all so that it, there wasn't actually a prohibition on it so much, it, it just sort of fell out of use because it was associated with ritual and it was drowned mm -hmm. on them. But when the Soviet era sort of ended, they were able to they were able to sort of bring that all back. And they said, you know, it was miraculous that that really just sort of happened. If it hadn't happened then, it would have happened ten years mm -hmm. later, that would never, never be able to, to occur. But the thing that they were saying, and I don't I don't know if this has been tested or not, but they were very optimistic about the fact that, that what they've been able to retain and, and, you know, through that whole period of 50 years or something like that was going to be incredibly important in sort of reshaping, reshaping the society and that sort of thing. So, I mean, I guess this is a sort of, it's a sort of resilience and it's a sort of thing that I guess some of those middle-aged women are sort of facing, I mean, they're going, to, they're going to get older and then what's going to happen, mm. you know? There's, so this generational thing, it's just very really brought home to me how important those generational things, you can get away with it for about three generations, but then, then what? That's true, but I suppose in the big case of Big Song, I mean, married women, their involvement would have been as I haven't had a chance to talk about here, Sangha, or song experts, which are the people who are responsible for uh, teaching, it's in a very formalised system. So apart from women before they married, they wouldn't have had any really other um, significant role in big song singing unless they happened to become one of these people. Whereas now we see that that entire cohort, I mean, it's even gotten to the stage where I remember um, some women telling me that it went from their husbands saying, are you really, I don't know if you can go off to sing and it being a huge process for them to negotiate that, to the husband's now saying, Every, all the other women are going, why aren't you going, you know? So um, I, I really see that as um, perhaps a positive sign and perhaps how it's becoming relevant in its original way but within a different group of the community. So like you say, of course that's a question in all traditions, what happens about the next generation? Um, yeah, it'll be interesting just to see what happens with the generations that are now going out to work. Because that's the, um, you know, the kind of resurgence you mentioned is what happened in gum areas um, following the Cultural Revolution in the 1980s. And then from the mid-90s, perhaps onwards, was when people started to migrate, young people started to migrate out of rural areas 
because they heard that there were work opportunities elsewhere. So that's the kind of period that those, um, especially those women that are back seeing now, were involved with. But what's going to happen to the, the women who are now, or the people who have been out to sing, have been out to work, will they come back? And will they want to sing? And that's, that's really going to be um, a different stage, I think. Yeah, but at the same time, as I mentioned, um, traditionally this big song is only sung in a region where it's estimated about today about 4% of the gum population live. Now it's a huge symbol of gumness, a, a, a huge symbol. And people, gum people outside this small region are wanting to learn it because it's their face, it's their voice. Um, the, a gum author that I've just recently um, completed an article with um, wrote me a lovely email about the process of us writing this article to do with Big Song and how, how meaningful Big Song is now to him and his community and his family, even though traditionally they don't sing it there. So it's, it's going to be really interesting. And um, yeah, I, I found just, I'm interested in knowing other ways to look at this situation besides just saying it's changed or it hasn't changed or... Yeah, the fact that the, um, the, the texts are the, the bones of the song mm -hmm. and the melody is, I guess, by uh, extension of the skin, but maybe it's not, not the core of the yeah. the, 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 the words are the core. Are the melodies less stable than the texts, therefore, or are, is it important when they teach you the melodies that it has to be just so, just like the text? No, I think you're right. And you, you could see from that, um, the chanting that I played, that's how, well, most songs are transmitted that way, actually. People, are, and if you're a really good singer and you're practicing for something, you don't even need to sing the song. You just know how to render that set of lyrics with those particular tonal patterns into um, that musical genre, or the saw, as it's called in gum. I call it a melodic habitus. You just know how to transfer that across. But that's the kind of knowledge that I wonder um, what's going to happen with that when uh, younger singers haven't perhaps learnt so many songs in that way. Perhaps they've only learnt those songs for stage performances. And the learning system is completely different because you've got to learn, we sing this line and then sing that line and you don't think about the logic of the story that you're telling through the, through the lyrics. Yeah. And I think that the um, the the lakka, the concept of the lyrics, um, unless there's great effort placed in um, making non-gum people aware of that as an important factor of gum musical systems, and there's great effort made in giving accurate translations of the lyrics, which I haven't seen too much of, um, doesn't look very promising as to, at least in the non-gum world, how that's going to move forward. Yeah. Um, I think one more question and then uh, we'll need to draw the discussion to... Just regarding, I think we want to have a bit, just regarding the importance within the community. Uh, so traditionally, the, the people that were singers or how I, I imagine had a high status Well, I mean, traditionally, like not in this now context, just to quote you the lyrics from perhaps the most well-known big song from my region, they say, um, So, if you don't sing, friends will say you're proud. Sit down and sing, people will say you're good and you're honest. So that kind of sums up um, what singing really means, in a sense. Some people were, um, as I mentioned, the sangha, who are song experts that are kind of like a repository of song. They're people who are really good at remembering songs and love them and like to sing them and taught them within the gum musical system. Um, my sense is that 
they were valued when it came to musical things, but they weren't necessarily given, at least in the past, a special status in other contexts. Though they did gain occasional benefits, like the, the singing groups would bring along loads of firewood at certain times to say thanks, or different things like that. That's my impression from what I've learnt through discussions. Today it's, it's kind of complex and as I mentioned the kind of interventions such as identifying um, certain people as representative transmitters and those people earn money from the Chinese state for doing that um, but that doesn't entirely overlap with the original system of who takes on that role it's really adds a complicating factor. There's also of course um, a lot of contention over who goes out to sing and gets to sing in those staged performances that earn money. What Are they now choosing people in terms of the traditional social factors? No, it's usually in terms of how that person looks on stage, not even how whether they can sing well or not. So those kinds of things are really, um, are really complicated. Um, I mean, we expect change, there has to be change, um, but it's interesting to see how those play out within the village context, therefore. And, and as I mentioned, I still see um, that sort of social engagement and the, um, the use of big song in a social way and the relationships that are formed amongst singers to still be important within that village context. But um, that's just for now. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks very much. Uh, Catherine, I'd like to invite you all to uh, join me in thanking Catherine for a wonderful talk. Thank you.